Hey, good morning. Hey, let's go do that. We just sang it. Let's go do it. It says shout of your goodness. So let's shout, the Lord is good. Okay, can we do that? One, two, three. The Lord is good. All right. I love doing it. That also says you can dance in that song too. So if you just, you know, one of those people, you just got to move. That's of the Lord. Enjoy it. Okay. So it is good to see you this morning. Welcome all of you here. And uh, welcome those who are watching on the live stream. It is great having you as well. That live stream audience continues to grow. So it's exciting that uh, wherever you're watching that we can, uh, we can learn together what the Lord is doing. So hey, before I jump into today's uh, message, uh, I, I do want to encourage, uh, again, the class. I know it was already announced, but the Bible class that is going to be uh, starting again on uh, this coming Wednesday... I know we've already done 10 weeks. I really want to encourage those who think you've, oh, I've already missed 10 weeks. It, it doesn't count if I show up now. It really does. It, it's all Bible understanding, Bible knowledge. It benefits you in your relationship with Jesus. It benefits you in, in learning how to follow him. So it is all beneficial no matter at what point you jump on board. We are learning together. And I'm excited that we're, we're going to do it a little different. And I'm excited for that. We're going to move the blue chairs in the middle out. We're going to put round tables in here. We have food for those that might are just coming right from work. And the whole child care piece. So again, it is so important that we try to make the word of God and understanding his word uh, a priority. We want to do it with a higher level of connection with each other. Oh, it's just good stuff. I am excited. So uh, anyway, please come. And again, the whole child care thing. L listen. I, I'm really glad we have that because this Wednesday we're covering uh, a certain area of, of, of books. We're going through five books and uh, I just got to tell you, one of them is at least PG-13. Just saying. You go, what? Oh yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm kind of baiting you, but it's true. I mean, it's true. For those of you who have never read the Song of Solomon, if you have, maybe you'll understand, if you haven't, Show up and find out yourself. Anyway, so I'm warning the parents who want to keep their kids with you. I'm not joking. Anyway, so there we go. Today, let me start off by asking you a question. Uh, do you remember, okay, think back when you're in school. Some of you are still in school, but do you remember being in school, taking tests, taking exams, right? Yeah, okay, so sorry if, if you're still traumatized by that experience, but... One of the things I always loved that our teachers would do or a prof would do would tell us in advance what's going to be on the test. I mean, that was always so helpful because, uh, listen, if you didn't study, it was kind of all on you. I mean, you can't blame anybody else but yourself. Of course, not every teacher did this. Some teachers just made it more difficult for you to study. And so I had a teacher my freshman year at Multnomah Bible College, okay, a long, long time ago. He, he was a, a professor that taught Old Testament Bible survey. And uh, sometimes that could be the, not the most exciting class. His name was Dr. Sourwine. <laughs> not making this up. Okay. And that was his name, was Dr. Sourwine. He did not give printed notes like you have this morning. It was all handwritten notes. He would lecture for one solid hour. And you're taking notes the entire time. And then when it came time for a, a test or a final or an exam, we would say, Dr. Sourwine, what is going to be on the test? And he would say, study your notes. That was all he'd tell you. Sometimes, I mean, listen, I'm not exaggerating. Sometimes I would have 50, 60 plus pages of notes, handwritten notes to study. Everybody's panicked for the first exam. That We take the first exam, almost the entire class bombed. I mean, you just can't study and retain that much knowledge. And so it's like, oh my gosh, how am I going to pass this class? I'm a freshman, I can't, I can't, I can't flunk this thing. Sometime during mid-semester, I figured out, I figured his system out. As he's lecturing, he would be up there on the board. He'd be talking, diagramming things. And he'd turn around and say, hey, now this is really important. You should remember this. And so I'd star that in my notes. I'd star the next time. So I'd do that. Here comes the next test. I didn't have time to study 60, 70, maybe even 80 pages of notes. I'm going to take a big risk. I am just going to study the things I starred. That's all I did. All my classmates are all stressing out. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? I'm just doing this. Oh, that's, that's so much, such a risk. Yeah, but I'm going to fall. I'm going to fail anyway, right? <laughs> Let's take a risk. I just studied all those things that I started. Everyone I started was on the exam. Aced it. 
Oh my gosh, all the other students were, what did you do, what did you do? So I started sharing my secret. In hindsight, I'm thinking, ah, I should have charged money. I could have paid for my education. <laughs> the desperation was that intense, but all right, I didn't know any better. Why am I sharing a story about exams? I don't wanna freak anyone out, but our lives are gonna have a final exam. You need to understand this, folks. It's called the judgment seat of Christ. In eternity, our lives are going to be evaluated for what we built in this life. The great thing is that Jesus told us what's going to be on the final. There doesn't have to be mystery. We don't have to be stressed out. He's very clear of, of what's going to matter. So I want, to, I want to share with you where that's in the Bible. 1 Corinthians uh, 3. Look at this. It says, For no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have, which is Jesus Christ. Okay, we have the foundation of our life, which is our relationship with Jesus, his forgiveness, our relationship with him. From that point on, you and I are building on that foundation. Anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety of materials. Great, what is it? Gold, silver, jewels, wood, hay, or straw. Oh, all right. But on judgment day, the fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work has any value. How? Well, if the work survives. Well, wood, hay, and straw doesn't survive fire very well. But the others does. The builder will receive a reward. Let me briefly explain this. Please do not be confused. Your eternal destination is an issue that is decided in this life and in this life alone. This is not deciding where you spend eternity. This is not deciding if your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, okay? This is a judgment where believers are going to stand before Jesus. You're already in heaven. Your eternal destination was decided in this life when you gave your life to Jesus. Done deal, decided at that point. Now, what did you do with the life Jesus gave you? What did you build on the foundation of his forgiveness that he gave to you? What did you do with your life? This is an award ceremony. This, this is going to be whether, whether we, we did things that will count for eternity or will we will be in heaven, but we're going to recognize that, wow, I could have lived my life a little bit different. Now, I have had a lot of conversations with people over the years who say, Pastor Dale, okay, that might be true. But I, you know what? The main thing is I just get in. That's all that matters. I guarantee you, you will change your mind in this moment. You will change your mind. Today, folks, I want you to understand some things. This series is all about using the building material that will be gold, silver, the jewels, the things that will survive the fire. Building a life that God will bless is for this life and the next. I want you to hear me. It's for this life and the next. It's kind of a big deal what we're doing with our lives and how we are building our lives on the foundation of Jesus. And that's what this series is all about. These are the things that God will bless in this life and the next. So today, we're going to look at the next thing. We're going to look at the issue of influence. How are we going to build our lives with influence? Now, the followers of Jesus have a role in this world. We have a role. Jesus is very clear. He, it's not a mystery. He's told us. Matthew 5, let's look at one of these passages. He says, you are the salt of the earth. Okay, his followers, you and I, you are the salt of the earth. But what good is salt if it's lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? No, as be thrown out and trampled underfoot is worthless. He goes on and says, you're not just salt, you're the light of the world. He says, a city on a hilltop, it can't be hidden. Let your light shine out in such a way that, that people will give, you know, they'll see your good deeds and glorify your father who is in heaven. Salt and light influence. Salt and light create change. Salt and light have to be unleashed in order to affect change. How do we build our lives with influence? Now, I got to tell you, this is how I pray for this church. This is how I'm praying for you. I mean, I, I, I don't want any surprises. You need to know how I pray for you. I pray that you get unleashed. I pray that this church gets unleashed. I pray that his church in general becomes unleashed to be the influential people and, and role that it is supposed to play in this world. So if we're to, to do that, how do we do it? So there's four things I want to share with you this morning. Here we go. Number one is this. If we're going to be influencers, we have to first embrace our role. Embrace the role. Now, 
I'm going to use this next passage. It's a paraphrase. A lot of uh, passages that I, I use, it's a translation. But this is a paraphrase, and I'm using it because I, I just love how it's worded. Look, Ephesians 4, 1 and 2. In light of all this, okay, all that God has done for you, here's what I want you to do. I want you to get out there, and I want you to walk. Better yet, run on the road that God called you to travel. I don't want any of you sitting around on your hands. So, see, it's biblical when I say we've got to get out of the blue chair. Okay, see, it's biblical. I don't want anyone strolling off down some path that goes nowhere. See, Jesus saved us to fulfill a very influential role in this world. So let me try to help us understand this because we have to embrace this role. How do we embrace it? First of all, let's understand this. Your role is more than believing. Your role in this world is more than believing. The church, I believe, has fallen in love with believing alone. Most Christians have been taught that simply believing in Jesus is enough. Now, before you think I'm speaking heresy, is this truly what the Bible says? The reality is this belief alone, you know what it does? It can create lazy, entitled, disengaged Christians who sit and build nothing for the kingdom of God they say they represent. Sometimes they take great pride in their beliefs and yet neglect a lifestyle that influences and serves others. Belief is not an end in itself, folks. It is a catalyst for following Jesus in this life. Our faith should lead us and inspire us to action. This is what the book of James is all about. When you read the book of James, if you've never read it, maybe you can go home and read it here this week. The book of James talks about faith. Faith without action. Faith without obedience. Faith without I get action, it says, is dead. It's useless. It's a worthless type of faith. Maybe the world sees the church as worthless because they observe faith alone without the actions that faith should inspire. It's obvious that faith alone isn't enough to keep people from leaving church. It's not enough to keep the next generation engaged. All the data is showing that people are leaving the church. Attendance in church is going down. And if you look at the younger generation, they're leaving the church in droves. It's not enough. And if we're going to embrace our role in this world, we must stop patting ourselves on the back for believing. If our faith doesn't move us to influence others for the kingdom of God in some way, men and women, we should take a serious look at what type of faith we really have. What type of faith do we really have? So our role is more than believing. And then let's take it another, let's take it another level. We have to move beyond our excuses. Move beyond excuses. I want to share with you four excuses that, that I've heard over the years. Four excuses that I've used myself over the years that keep us from influence. Here you go. Well, okay, Pastor Dale, that, that's fine. I know I should influence, but I'm not qualified to influence like you, all right? You're a pastor. Of course you're qualified. I'm a nobody. You're exactly who God uses. Look at the word of God. First Corinthians 1 says, Instead, God chose the things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. He chose things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chose things despised by the world. Things counted as nothing at all. You're, th you're sitting here thinking, I'm a nobody. Perfect. I'm nothing at all. Th that's who he uses. Now, believe me, you're not nothing at all. But I'm just telling you, the excuse you're using that you're not qualified, it, it's, that's, that's you. That's the lie you hear. You're exactly who God uses because God uses normal, average, everyday people. He doesn't like, he's not looking for superstars. He's looking for you. And he uses you in a supernatural way. The power is not in, in, in you being some great gifted person. The, the, the power is God in you. The power is in your obedience and your willingness just to do what the word of God says. It's obedience that equals the blessing. So you are qualified. Here's the next one I hear a lot. I don't know enough, Pastor Dale. I mean, I didn't go to Bible college like you. And in some ways, that's good. Because sometimes, I, I, sometimes you can have more influence than me. I know I say this a lot, but you know, when I travel, I don't tell people I'm a pastor. It ruins conversations, okay? 
It just does. On a plane, when I'm, when I'm traveling, we have, a, uh, we have a rule now, or it's just a strategy that my wife and I use when we're, we're traveling, when somebody eventually asks you, hey, what do you do for a living? Because <laughs> sometimes, I'm telling you, sometimes people just don't want to talk to somebody who says, I'm a pastor, right? They start thinking about all the cuss words they just used. It, ha- it happens every time. <laughs> every time. So what, what, what we say now is, is I go, hey, you know what? Um, listen, uh, we, my wife and I, we just have a, a rule, a general rule. When I travel, I can't talk about work. It's true. I'm not lying. And they go, oh, oh, that's okay. That's okay. See, and then, and then the conversation can go on. So anyway, uh, so you can actually have more influence than me. I don't know enough. Acts 1, 8, look what it says. You will be my witness telling people about me everywhere. See, witnesses only share what they've experienced. God's not asking you to share your wealth of Bible knowledge. He's not asking you to be a Bible answer person. People get all freaked out. Oh, pastor, what if I can't answer the question? I can't answer all the questions. What are you worried about? I say I don't know all the time. God's big. He's kind of mysterious. I I can't understand everything. Relax. Relax. Just share what you've experienced. Just share how Jesus has made a difference in your life, your marriage, your emotions, your pain, your wounds. Your, I mean, just you're a witness. You just share what you've experienced. That's it. Huh. So I guess you do know enough. Here's the next one. I don't have time, Pastor. I don't have time, which we've all used. But we need to... We need to listen to what Jesus said. Matthew 6, 33. To seek the kingdom of God above all else. Folks, if we don't have time to influence others, we have a priority issue. I understand that we all have responsibilities and they seem overwhelming. I get it. Family, kids, jobs, school, life. I I, I get it. All those things are, are, are reality. But how does my life reflect Jesus? Seek the kingdom of God. Are we kingdom minded? Are we kingdom minded about influence? I mean, God wants to use you. He's not telling you that you shouldn't have a job and that money doesn't matter. It's just that your, your family and your kids, it's just that you should influence all of that. That's, that's, that's the kingdom. He wants to, you, you were to bring the kingdom to all of that. Seek the kingdom of God above, above all else. How does my life reflect what Jesus said? I mean, I just, I just want us to ask that question. I don't quote that verse to make us all feel guilty, all right? It's, it's just, sometimes we just live without that in our head, and it needs to be. All right, one more. Four is enough. I'm afraid of what others may think. I'm afraid of what others may say or, or think of me. And I'm always reminded of this Romans 1.16 passage where it says, I'm not ashamed of the good news or I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Okay, same thing about Christ. It is the power of God at work saving everyone who believes. We don't have to help God out by trying to make the gospel or the good news sound more intellectually satisfying to people, folks. It is the power of God at work. It is the power of God at work. It will always sound foolish to some people. Yes, some people may look at you and say, oh, really, you believe in some mythical God who came to earth and born as a baby and died on a cross for my sin. I don't need anyone dying for my sin. You'll change your mind, but that's okay. You feel that way today. There will always be some people who who see the gospel as foolishness. But folks, that doesn't mean everybody responds that way. It is the power of God, whether they respond in a way that that they think it's foolishness or not. It is the power of God. It's what it says. It is the power of God. There is something powerful about sharing the gospel. There is something powerful about representing the gospel. And we need to believe that. And we need to stop being ashamed or embarrassed of that. Ask God to help you move beyond your fear of what others may think or say this year. Embrace the role. Now, the second thing, if we're going to do that, then we're going to have to see opportunities that are around us because God has given us opportunities. Ephesians 5, look what it says. Be careful how you live. Be careful. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Yep, they're pretty evil. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. What does the Lord want us to do? He wants us to have influence. 
He wants us to have influence. So how do we do that? A couple things. First of all, everyone has opportunities to influence. You all have opportunities. You don't have to join a ministry to have influence. Influence should begin in our normal, everyday lives. We all have opportunities all around us to influence others spiritually in some way. Now, I want to talk to the married folks for a moment. Listen, sometimes, sometimes we forget that influence starts with the circle closest to us. So although you who are married, how are you influencing your spouse spiritually? See, sometimes we don't, we don't, even, we don't even think like this. Well, what do you mean? I should be influencing my coworkers. We'll get to that. Are you influencing your spouse? Husbands, I got to ask you this question. How are you influencing your wife spiritually? Well, what do you mean? Ask the question. Ladies, be quiet for a moment. <laughs> Because ladies, you have the same question. How are you influencing your husband spiritually? Influence. Because let's hope that we're not influencing them in a negative manner. Parents, if you're, if you're, if you're a parent and you've got kids, how are you influencing your children? How are you influencing them spiritually? Your, your job is to influence. How are you influencing them? Well, I'm bringing them to church. Awesome. It's more than that, though. I mean, I'm so glad you are. It's more than that. I take them to FSM. That's awesome. But it's more than that. They need to see you at home. I know this isn't a parenting class, but let me just give you a parenting principle about spiritual transformation. You want your faith to transfer to the next generation. Your children need to see your transformation first. They need to see how Jesus makes a difference in your life. They need to see you wrestling with life, following Jesus in this life. They need to see your spiritual growth. They need to see your faith being challenged. They need to see you learning how to trust Jesus all in front of them. That's how your faith transfers to them. Of course, we should ask ourselves, how are we influencing our friends, our coworkers, the opportunity for that random encounter when we're out and about in this world at a store or, or anywhere else. Please stop thinking that influence is sharing biblical content with someone. This is where the church has just, I think, misses it. This wrong belief, you know, I think, what stops most people. We influence most by our actions. We influence others by the observable qualities. They are watching you. Influence happens when people see our loving relationships. I mean, Jesus said that. The world will know. I mean, let's just do what Jesus said. Influence happens as people experience our attitudes. Influence happens as people see our joy, our kindness, our hopeful perspective, our graciousness towards others, our words, how we handle stress, disappointment, wounding, forgiveness, all the things that they're dealing with. But they see us and they watch how we deal with it differently. Influence. This is why Ephesians 5 says, don't act thoughtlessly in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly. Another, it's another way for, for the author is, is saying, come on, church, you got to get in the game. You got to get in the game. You got to have your head in the game. These are evil days. These might be the last days. Pastor, do you think it's the last days? Of course it's the last days. What does that mean? I don't know. <laughs> is Jesus coming back soon? I hope so. But it is not time to just pack our bags and wait. It is time. If Jesus is coming back imminently, then we better be in the game when he shows up. Amen. That's what we're called to do. And have influence to the day he comes back. So I want you to pray about opportunities. That's the next thing. Lord, how would you have me influence for you? Can you just pray that prayer? I mean, last week was on prayer. So you're already praying, right? You're already praying. So add this, Lord, how would you have me influence for you? Influence isn't always having a conversation about Jesus with someone. I mean, it might, and that's wonderful. But we represent Jesus and his kingdom in a variety of ways, like I said earlier. Again, it could be as simple as that, just that act of kindness to someone. This world is so cruel. Just be different. Okay, when you pray about influence, here's what's going to happen. Here's why I want you to pray. Your eyesight will improve. What do you mean? 
you'll see opportunities that you didn't see before. When you pray about something, your spiritual sensitivity, your spiritual eyes, your spiritual ears get better. And so if you ask the Lord for opportunities, I guarantee you these opportunities have been around you already. You're just not in the, you're mentally not in the game. You're spiritually not in the game. So start praying about opportunities. Just ask, Lord, would you give me opportunities? Would you help me see these opportunities? And would you give me courage to take advantage of them? Because you'll also find this. When you pray about something, you're also going to find more courage to be obedient. God will give you the courage you need to step into these opportunities. See opportunities around you. All right, here's the third thing. Be intentional. Be intentional. Intentional. Proverbs 16.3 says, commit your actions to the Lord and your plans will succeed. Proverbs 21 says, good planning and hard work lead to prosperity. These verses both talk about intentionality. And we need that when it comes to following Jesus and building our lives. We aim, for, we sh- if we don't aim at anything, that's, that's just what we hit, okay? Being intentional is simply having a plan. It is a plan that we commit to the Lord because we're trying to be obedient. Lord, here's what you said. You want me to follow you. You want me to be an uh, an influence for you in this world. And so, okay, so here's some ways I can do that. Redirect me however you want. You commit your plan to the Lord and then you just, you you try to follow. Therefore, besides what I just talked about earlier regarding opportunities, I want to take it one step further. I want to ask you to do two things. Two ways to be intentional with influence. Ready? Here you go. Number one. Be intentional, first of all, employing your gifts. Okay? Your, your, your gifting that God put inside of you. Your gifts and abilities were given to you for influence. When you gave your life to Jesus, some of you have heard me talk about this many times before. Some of you, this is new. If you've given your life to Jesus, a spiritual gift was placed inside of you. It is in you. The Holy Spirit's inside of you. And you are gifted to use a spiritual gift to have influence on other people. It was not given to you for your benefit. It was given to you to benefit the body of Christ, the church, others. Whether or not you recognize what that gift is or use that gift, it does not change the biblical truth that that gift exists in you. Your gifts and abilities were given to you for influence. How are you intentionally now using them? When you begin to understand them and use them, that's being intentional. Once I began to see things in my life, in fact, sometimes other people pointed those out. Early on, when I was a teenager, there are certain things that God put inside of me that, that were, were, began to be pointed out back when I was in high school. For example, I have always had an ability to gather information and organize it and share it. I don't know why, well I do. God made me that way. So in high school, remember when you had to do um, uh, reports, okay? Research projects and people would panic and they would hate it. It was the worst thing ever, but I hate research projects. I'm the guy that liked them, okay? I'm sorry. I liked them because for some reason it just made a lot of sense. Back then we didn't have uh, Wi-Fi, we didn't have the internet, so you had to use this thing called a library. Okay, but anyway, I'd go to a library, I could lay books out, I could gather all this information, I could put it and synthesize it, put it in a linear way and, and write reports. I've just always been able to do it. Weird, right? Okay, somebody saw that early on, asked me to do it with the Bible. Look at this. I have this ability to take God's word, organize it, share it, compile it, make it make sense. So I began to use those gifts early on. What got me involved in that was getting involved in ministry. I mean, I was 18 years old teaching junior hires. I feel sorry if any of you were part of that class. I apologize now. But those gifts began to come out. That's how you discover your gifts. One of the simplest and intentional decisions you can make is to step into influence by becoming part of an existing ministry or program somewhere here at Foothills. That decision gives you a consistent opportunity to discover and employ your gifts. How can you get involved serving somewhere? How can you begin to understand what God put inside of you for influence? He put it there for influence, see? Stop believing a lie that you can't influence. You can influence. You have a gift inside of you to do just that very thing. So we have influence needs here at Foothills. I want to talk about a few. We have influence needs. Well, don't you mean ministry needs? Yes, but everything here at Foothills exists for 
influence. Understand what we're about and what I'm asking you to be a part of is influence. We have kids ministry influence needs. We want to keep expanding that ministry. We want to take care of parents. We want to take care of kids. If we want to have influence on a community, we have to take care of families. Help us. Some of you are uniquely wired, gifted. You have a passion you, to help us with this. Help us get, be involved, growing those ministries. We have child care needs on Wednesday night. You heard me, we're going to start this Bible class. We're doing child care on Wednesday night. And we currently don't have enough people to sustain it for 10 weeks, but we started anyway. Because I believe some of you are going to help us with that. Help us get through these 10 weeks. Help us with some child care needs so that we can teach the word of God to people and have influence. You're just not watching some kid in the nursery. You are helping us have influence. We have, a, we have an idea of uh, wanting to start a Saturday service. Why would you start a Saturday service? Well, because eventually these services get full. They're filling up. We're going to run out of room. So what are we going to do when these services are completely full? Oh, stop our influence? Well, that's not going to happen. You don't know me very well, then do you, right? We're going to keep chasing this thing. But for us to have a Saturday service, and it's it probably, you know, Lord willing, maybe in the fall. It'll take that long because we will need an army of volunteers. I think it takes 60 to 70 volunteers to pull off one service. That's how many things are going on behind the scenes that you don't see. We need your help so that we can have more influence in our community, reach more people for Jesus, because that's what we're here to do. If you uh, want to know, again, all the places you can get involved, you can go to our website, you, you can go check it out. You can sign up on our website. There's a volunteer application form on our website. You know what, though? Listen, at, sometimes in the moment, sometimes you need to do something in the moment. You're sitting here going, right now, I know I should get involved, Pastor Dale. And then you go home and you think about it and life take goes on and then you forget and then you feel guilty. Stop, just do it right now. Take that blue card out. I want to get involved somewhere. Somebody contact me. Now I know that's not the prescribed way to do things and I'm sure I'm going to get in trouble tomorrow morning about it, okay? Don't care. I don't care. I want to see people get involved. Come on, help us do this thing. And watch God use your life to make a difference. So, for those of you that are already upset with me for tomorrow, please forgive me, okay? But the bottom line is influence, so let's go do it. So there you go. Let's be intentional. Here's another thing. Let's be intentional with social media. Now, folks, the time has come for me to stop complaining about social media. For those of you that have been around the last couple of years, I have shared plenty of negative information, information and data regarding social media, and it's all still true. But somebody pointed this out to me, and so they're right. Basically, it's like, Pastor Dale, you gotta quit complaining about social media because that's where people are, and that's where we need to go to reach them. You're right. So, my complaining days of social media are done. <laughs> now, let's go be intentional. Right? Let's go be intentional. Yeah, it's not, not going to change the fact that, that, okay, it is what it is. But that is where people hang out. And as missionaries to a broken world, that's who we, we should have that kind of a mindset. We go where people are. And if they're on social media platforms, then that's where we're going to go. And so here's what I am asking all of us to do, Okay. We all can do this. Some of you may not be able to rearrange your life to be involved in a, in a weekly ministry right now, but you could all do this. Those of you watching from home, okay, those of you on the live stream, you can be involved in this as well. You can be involved in this as well. Okay, here it is, two things, not in your notes, write this down. First of all, one, follow us, okay? Follow us on the social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, okay? Follow us, you already do. Fantastic, fantastic. But please do that. The second thing, share. Follow us and then share the content. We are being so much more intentional with trying to share content that makes it easy for you to share. We don't want to simply share information. I want to share inspiration. I want to inspire people to question, 
inspire people to follow. Uh, folks, and so you're going to see a lot of changes, and we have made some changes, but you're going to even see more in the, in the weeks and the months to come. And so follow us on Instagram, follow us on Facebook. I've got an Instagram account that we're trying to create more, uh, more traction with, so the church has one and I have one. Okay, so, so be involved in that, and then when you see this content comes out, if it ministers to you, share it. Maybe everything doesn't, that's okay. But if it does, oh, must it be awesome to share my friends or whoever else is on your feeds. Share it. it be intentional. Let's get some good stuff going out there, amen? amen? Then let's be intentional with it. And, and again, I'm trying to um, up my game when it comes to that. And uh, just to let you know something that we're working on, I'm gonna start a podcast. Okay, I got some people helping me with that. And so we're going to start a podcast. It's going to launch in April. And so we are looking forward to that. So when that gets launched, I will ask you to participate with that as well. We are going to call it Real Life with PD. Right? Because I, I believe we have got to follow Jesus in real life and deal with real issues and the messiness of this world. But we have to follow Jesus in that world. Not the one that sometimes is represented elsewhere. I want to deal with real issues, real struggles. Hey, anyway, that's what the podcast is. I better stop because the podcast isn't yet. It's in April. So there you go. Be intentional. Can we do this? Can we be intentional? Let me know you're tracking with me, huh? Are we, you, there, you with me? Yes. Okay. Okay. I can come down on the floor if I need to get closer. All right? <laughs> Not yet. Okay. Last one. Let me wrap up with this. Very quickly. We have to let God change us. Let God change you. We can't be effective influencers until we are transformed people. Romans 12, 2, look, don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world. Let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. This does not mean we are perfect people, but we're in the process of letting God change our lives. Will you let God change you, transform you this year? As we're transformed, God gives us more influence. I want you to understand these two things are connected. As your life looks less like the world, the light in you gets brighter and brighter for people to see. The reason the church has lost so much influence over the years, I believe, has less to do with strategy and everything to do with a lack of transformation in the people of God. How can the church influence the world if we look just like it? Do you truly want to embrace your role as an influencer? Would you be willing to pray, Lord, show me? This is a great prayer. Lord, show me where I'm looking too much like the world. Don't be scared to pray that prayer. Being transformed is a good thing. It's a good thing. And God's not here to beat you up. He's here to transform us. Last thing, we can't be transformed without changed thinking. This verse says, how are we transformed? By changing the way you think. If we think like the world, we act like the world. Most of the surveys out there that, that are on church, and there's so much data that's going on with church right now that we are seeing and I'm reading about attitudes and attendance and belief systems. And I'm telling you folks, the church as a whole is shifting to think like the world. It has shifted. And if the, and if the church is going to think like the world, then it is going to act like the world. The problem with our thinking is that it's connected to a lack of biblical understanding. The less we know of the Bible, the more we think like the world. That's why understanding your Bible is so important. That's why I keep asking you to read it. That's why I ask you to come to the class on Wednesday night because it is connected not to information. It is connected to your transformation. That's why it's such a big deal. I promise not to bore you with the word of God. I promise, okay? But you should already know that. Will you allow the word of God to influence your thinking? Would you ask the Lord, Lord, where does my thinking need to change? Where does my thinking, where's my thinking like the world? Folks, it's gonna be that way for the rest of our lives. The Lord is still correcting my behavior. He is still correcting my thinking. That's gonna go on for the rest of my life. It's, it's, the, it's the ongoing progression of transformation. But we should be asking those questions because as we're transformed, God uses us for even more influence. So how are you going to build your life with influence? Yeah, someday our lives will be evaluated. 
how we built on the foundation of Jesus. We build on that foundation with prayer. That was last week. And, and today we talked about building on that foundation with influence. So how can now you build your life with influence? What's the, the steps that you can take? What's the intentionality you can give to it? What are the people around you that, that God has, he's put those people in your life to influence? I end with the prayer that I started with, how I pray for this church. Unleash us. God, unleash us. It's one thing to sing a song that talks about that. You know, unleash your kingdom, you know, yay. You know how he does that? Through you. Through his church. Let's be unleashed. Let's be an unleashed church that God uses in ways we couldn't even dream. Let's go on that journey together. Okay, I'm not asking you to go it alone. Let's do it together. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I'm just asking you to unleash us. Unleash your church. Unleash your people. Lord, everybody's life is so unique. And so I pray that you would show each person here how you want them to influence uniquely for you. In, in their, their realm of influence, their marriage, their family, their friends, their coworkers, their community, their neighborhood, whatever it looks like. I pray that we just don't make it harder than it needs to be. Let's just be the people of God in this context that we live in, this broken world, and you'll give us opportunities in the moment. And Lord, this church, you have placed us here for such a time as this. It's not an accident. It's not random fate. It's a God of purpose who has put us here to influence a geographic area and bring hope. I pray that you would unleash Foothills Community Church in a way that we have yet to experience so people can find the hope and the power that's only in the gospel of Jesus. We love you and we need you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You need someone to pray with you? Always at the end of our services, we always have that. Whether I say it or not, there's always here underneath the cross, there'll always be people there. So at this service, we got some people that, that are back there or underneath that cross. They'll just pray with you. If you just need someone to, to pray with before you go, your life is just, it was just even maybe too painful to even listen to what I had to say. Do not leave. Let someone pray with you and love on you. All right. Lord bless you.